If you put the recipes out there and other people coming from non-motivated thinking can reproduce it, then you're getting closer to objective, verifiable results. You're getting closer to an understanding of how the universe responds. And you could say that this is something that we have learned about the universe. This is the scientific process in action. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Produced by Soapbox Media. The world needs evidence-based public policy now more than ever. Making the right decisions should not be partisan politics. Please help spread the rational view by going to patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Together, we can make a better future. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, I want to follow up on last week's podcast uh, regarding the announcement of the discovery of a room temperature ambient pressure superconducting uh, sample, uh, how scientists address this claim, and I want to compare the uh, media frenzy and social media following of this and and the, how the science played out. I want to compare that with the cold fusion fiasco uh, from the 1980s, which I also had uh, several podcasts on previously. If you like what you're hearing, please hit the like button on your podcast app. It really helps with spreading the word. Uh, come join me on the Facebook group and post any questions or interesting uh, discussion items you'd like to talk about. The issue. Two preprints appeared on the ARXIV server, that's A-R-X-I-V, and this is an online web server which publishes preprints of unpeer-reviewed literature in a way to disseminate the research results rapidly, more rapidly to the scientific community. This was done like a, a couple weeks ago, uh, and the claims came from uh, Southern Korea uh, group of researchers that have claimed to have discovered room temperature superconductivity in a sample of lead apatite, which is which is a crystal, a rock that had been doped with copper. So let's let's look at the the things we have to know about our exhibit. It's not a peer reviewed site, so this is not science that has been reviewed by anyone. This is it can be very sloppy, it can be very speculative. So you have to have some skepticism on any results that are that are floated on here. They they these scientists floated this. They probably wanted to determine precedence because it was a big discovery that they thought they had, world-changing Nobel Prize material, and they certainly didn't want to be scooped by anyone, uh, and they wanted to get that out to the public to uh, have other people take a look at it. They knew that announcing a room temperature uh, superconductor would certainly take the world by storm. Uh, so superconductivity is when you have a material that has no resistance. Any wires that we have, copper wiring in your house, wires and transmission, you know, even aluminum wiring, all of this has resistance to current. So when current flows through it, uh, it creates heat. So you lose um, energy through the production of heat. And the lower the resistance, the more current can flow without overheating. And this is why in magnetic resonance imagers in, in hospitals, you need big coils of wire and you need a lot of cooling. Um, to prevent uh, the heat from from these super from these big heavy magnets uh, from overheating, and it this is why we lose a lot of energy through our electricity grid. Is the transmission wires have losses, so you can't transmit energy all around the world with zero losses because there is no such thing as a room temperature superconductor. And, but there are superconductors. There are these things. They exist, but they are all cryogenic, and. What, mean, what that means is you have to keep them cold. You have to use like a, a liquid refrigerant, like liquid nitrogen or liquid helium even, which is very difficult to handle and very expensive and costs a lot of energy just to make. So they're mainly only used in very specialized applications like research projects and uh, excel particle accelerators and that sort of thing. But researchers believe that the processes involved in superconductivity could work at higher temperatures. And there's been a, an ongoing search for decades to find higher and higher temperature operating superconductors. And as the temperature gets in the, in these solid structures gets higher, the, the atoms inside the lattice are bouncing around more and they 
tend to interrupt the electrons and scatter them from a smooth zero resistance path and they cause losses. So scientists have been looking at the theory of superconductors and how to make them work at higher temperatures for several decades. And there are several well-funded research efforts around the world trying to find this because if you could find this, then suddenly you could think about, you know, very cheap magnetically levitated trains, very cheap power distribution, low losses and all sorts. It would take the world by storm. Automatic Nobel Prize. So let's compare what happened. This is the same similar type of world changing announcement as the cold fusion announcement. In both cases, these things were announced publicly not through a peer-reviewed journal, but re through an unreviewed source. In the Cold Fusion case, it was a, a hastily convened press conference from the researchers to, to announce that they've discovered a way to do nuclear fusion in a test tube. And this one, it was a, a, a preprint, two preprints on the ARGS of server, which then went out to the world and was available for analysis. In both cases, many labs realizing the importance of the potential announcement rushed to reproduce the work to find out if it was true or if there was an error. In both cases, and this is an interesting parallel between the two, in both the cold fusion and the superconducting anal analysis case, both the groups making these analyses were outsiders. They weren't the main labs that had been working on this forever. They were, they were seen as outsiders to the field of nuclear fusion in the one case, and superconductivity in the other case. Uh, working with something that had not been considered viable by the mainstream researchers. So this is, in the super con in the cold fusion case, this created a lot of pushback. This created a lot of skepticism, and maybe even some some noses got out of joint, because these people had been working in fusion for, for several years, and if, if these chemists, Pons and Fleischmann, had come up with a way to make fusion in a test tube, it, it really put some egg on the face of these people that were spending hundreds of millions of dollars with lasers and and uh, tokamaks and all sorts of weird, expensive hardware. If they could do it in a test tube, it basically put their life's work in jeopardy. In the superconductivity, superconductivity case, similar thing. A lot of people probably had their noses out of joint, but... This is science. In science, we're supposed to take our emotion and set it aside. We're supposed to set aside personal biases, and we're supposed to look at the facts and try to reproduce it. So in the superconducting announcement uh, recently, a very thorough recipe was put forward about how to make this stuff. So this is a little bit different than the cold fusion case where they were very cagey about protecting how it was done, and they put very few details out in their press conference. Uh, so there's a lot of confusion as to how to reproduce it. And there was a lot of, in both cases, most of the initial attempts to reproduce failed. And so far, we haven't had a confirmed replication of either process. Although, um, as I said in my previous podcast on cold fusion, there has been a community uh, that have been investigating some of the anomalous results that came out of this over many decades now. And there is a, a strong contingent that think there is something there. In the superconducting case, uh, you know, it's very early days, but people have had the time to reproduce, go through the, the recipe to produce this lead appetite with copper and make measurements on it to see if it's superconducting. So most of the initial attempts so far have failed to find superconductivity and have failed to reproduce key uh, aspects of the uh, preprint papers. Now, there remains the possibility that certain undocumented preparation steps are needed to produce the results that we're seeing. The, the Korean group supposedly has been working on this for up to five years. So perhaps they have some um, special tricks that they use that has that didn't get into the paper that weren't obvious to, that were obvious to them, but weren't obvious to others. Until this is figured out and controlled, there is no discovery. There is no science. The science has falsified the superconductivity announcement. And that, of course, you know, um, it's sad because everyone was very excited about it, but it's also how science works. And this has happened before. People make mistakes. Maybe there is something else yet there, but in, in the case of most people, they're going to close the book on this and, and wait until other research comes out. So I will give you these caveats. It is easy to produce a negative, uh, result. It's easy to make a mistake. It's, 
you know, very easy to do a sloppy um, attempt at verification. Assuming the Koreans have been working to perfect this superconductor for five years, um, it could be that there is something else to it. But so far, it hasn't panned out. And going off of some posts on X, which used to be Twitter, I was reading a, a post from a, from Andrew McCallop in the U.S. showing that they had made a tiny submillimeter sample using following the steps that exhibited many of the traits claimed by the Koreans, and they sent it off to the USC Materials Consortium. It had the the lattice constrict contraction that was expected by adding copper to the lead aptate, so it became a little bit denser, like a, a half a percent in uh, more dense or smaller than the lead apatite itself. And the sample levitated in a magnetic field, which is one of the things that a superconducting sample will do. However, this is not unique to superconductors. A diamagnetic, uh, there are different types of magnets that will also do this that are not superconducting. Um, so it turns out after analysis of this by the USC Materials Consortium, that the sample actually had an unexpected impurity of metallic iron in it, and that was causing the anomalous magnetic effects, the levitation. And the significant three orders of magnitude drop in conductivity that was measured in this sample, in this verification attempt, was actually found to be due to a phase transition of uh, crystallites of copper sulfide. So this is a multi-crystalline sample that they're using. It's not just a pure alloy. It's got lots of different crystals. And it looks like some of the different crystals are doing different things. And some of the known compounds in this copper sulfide, copper sulfide impurities have a physical transition to high conductivity around 378 Kelvin, similar to what was uh, presented in the Korean paper. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, that there's diamagnetic properties of, of lead appetite, uh, and, and iron impurities can also ha use ferromagnetic properties. So these are all different physical terms for different types of magnetism or different responses to applied magnetic fields. And these can cause these things to levitate similar to superconductors. So the two things combined, if you're working on superconducting, can be very exciting, right? You've got a, a sample that, suddenly it has a three orders of magnitude increase in conductivity. It's levitating a magnetic field. It's like, oh my God, Nobel Prize visions appear in their head. They need to publish. So they rush to, to get this out so that they have um, precedence on this so that, you know, they get the million dollar prize when it, if it does turn out to be real. There was no, there are no claims that this is false, that this was fraud. The results seem to be just a mistake or maybe uncareful measurement of resistivity at this point. So, you know, kudos on them for getting there. This is how the scientific process goes. Motivated reasoning is common. We know that scientists have motivated reasoning. We know that scientists are people with, with human uh, emotions and human drivers and, and bias, even though even the most unbiased scientist still has some personal uh pushes and pulls. There are motivated reasoning is common. And the scientific process is there to get around this fact. We try to publish something that can be objectively reproduced by people in different countries, people of different religions, people of different backgrounds, people of different thought patterns. If you put the recipes out there and other people coming from non-motivated thinking can reproduce it, then you're getting closer to objective verifiable results you're getting closer to an understanding of how the universe responds and you could say that this is something that you know outside of my uh predispositions and my biases this is something that we have learned about the universe this is the scientific process in action so that being said a a beautiful uh a beautiful hypothesis has been shot down by ugly science yet again more application attempts are are still ongoing and careful more careful rep, uh, replication in collaboration with the Koreans to to understand their processes and make sure that no one's making a mistake there have been um claims on the original paper that this was done in thin film deposition rather than in in solid samples uh so that still needs to be verified 
There is a Korean committee that has been tasked to investigate these claims in close collaboration with the scientists. And on Twitter, I saw a recent announcement from a Dr. Awana of the National Physics Lab in New Delhi, India, who has been in contact with the Korean researchers. He's published two negative results so far on tests, on samples that his lab has, has developed. Uh, the most recent one, he's just shown a video of strong magnetism and low conductivity. Uh, samples are, are levitating, consistent with superconductivity, but it also is consistent on with the failed replications of superconductivity. So we're still waiting. At this point, skepticism reigns supreme in the scientific community. It's back to the point of it's been debunked on its surface. There is something else that needs to be uh, done to make this to make this a superconductor and that either hasn't been published or doesn't exist. So overall, in my estimation, I think the scientists have have reacted appropriately to the announcement, have rushed to test it out of interest, and you know before this became peer reviewed, we've found that there have been some errors. Probably most of these scientists will go back to their previous work. Uh, unless and until the committed Korean groups and other labs can refine their claims to something reproducible. That's the heart of science. This is how it works. The press coverage as well, I have been very happy with looking at the headlines that have come out. Many of them have stressed that skepticism is still needed. So this is educated journalism. They, the journalists know that the preprint server is not peer reviewed. It hasn't been tested. It is a single announcement of a hopeful thing. And I think the press coverage has been appropriately balanced in this case. Uh, skepticism has been highlighted. And this has really been a good thing in giving the public a ringside seat to the scientific process in action, investigating really exciting claims. And there's been a huge groundswell of interest on social media for this announcement. I think this bodes well for science and scientific journalism and understanding in the future. Now, if only we could build on this and turn science into a spectator sport where, where lead scientists are traded between world leading labs with huge revenues similar to other sporting events, I think the world would be a much better place. In coming podcasts, I'm thinking about investigating uh, other claims, claims you may have seen in the news of a global decrease precipitous decrease in insect populations over um, previous decades. Is it true? What are the impacts? What is the cause? Stay tuned to The Rational View. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page, at patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Thanks for listening.